Hi everyone, today we're going to be giving a brief introduction to galactic anatomy. And so what that means is that we're really interested in sort of just defining the terms for the parts of a galaxy so that when we dive into their individual physics interactions, they kind of make sense and you understand uh, sentences like the stellar disk is filled with the cold neutral medium. Uh, those kinds of words are what we're going to be covering today. So uh, that's going to happen in a few parts. I'm going to give you just a brief overview of the main parts of a galaxy, dark matter, stars, the interstellar medium, and supermassive black holes. Then we'll go on a little tour across the spectral energy distribution and look at so the different types of light that we see from a galaxy and use that information to later on to understand what we're seeing. Uh, we'll do a brief review of different galaxy types uh, and sort of show you some of the different phenomena that we can see. And then finally, we'll close out with a few notes about the unique factors of being stuck inside the Milky Way. Uh, so these are the big parts of the galaxy. We have the uh, dark matter halo, which is made of dark matter. More on that in a moment. Uh, and then buried down inside the dark matter halo is the actual galaxy itself, made of stars and the interstellar medium. And then right here at the center, there's a supermassive black hole in almost all galaxies that have what's called a stellar bulge. So the dark matter halo, let's get started. This is fundamentally the most important part of a galaxy. Uh, we study all the other stuff because we can see it, but the dark matter halo is what makes a galaxy into a galaxy. It is the self-gravitating uh, region defined by a dark matter, uh, a, a self-gravitating bunch of dark matter. Uh, now, what is dark matter? Good question. Nobody knows. But we know a lot about it. We have great evidence that it must exist, and we're still trying to identify what's happening in particle physics that explains what dark matter actually is. So we think that the dark matter must be a weakly interacting massive particle, and every one of those uh, words is important. So uh, the first is that we think it's massive. So it has a non-zero rest mass, and uh, it's a particle. So we think that this is something that particle physics is going to have to ultimately explain in the context of the standard model and amendments to the standard model that will explain where this particle fits in with the other particles we know, like protons and neutrons and neutrinos and such. So the other key part about this is it is weakly interacting. And so a weakly interacting uh, particle is kind of like this alternate dimension particle that only rarely if at all, interacts with ordinary matter through any force except through gravitation. So we think that the universe is filled with this material, this dark matter, and it is undergoing self-gravity with itself and also all of the material out there, the protons and the neutrons, also feel the gravity from dark matter. But that may be it. We are hoping, really hoping, that the particle physics of this in this WIMP, this weakly interacting massive particle, are such that it has some interaction with ordinary matter. Is it through the weak nuclear force, which is kind of inspired here? We know that it cannot be a strongly interacting massive particle, so because otherwise we would see evidence for these particles colliding with ordinary matter all the time. So we think that that interaction must be rare. And so the strength of the interaction is weak rather than it necessarily operating through the weak nuclear force, though the two may actually end up being simultaneously true. Uh, we do know that the characteristic speed of a dark matter particle as it's whizzing around the galaxy is about 300 kilometers per second. And that's just set by the shape of the, uh, and that's determined by the shape of the galaxy and the amount of ma dark matter in it. And so you can figure out what the speed of it is, even if you don't know the mass of an individual particle. We think it's organized into a halo. That halo is much larger than the optically visible parts of a galaxy. They're buried down here in the middle, but then the dark matter halo stretches out to 10 to 30 times as large as the visible part of a galaxy. So it's this 
big, huge system that is actually what the galaxy is, because almost all of the mass in the galaxy, uh, 10 times as much as the visible matter in our case, that's hanging out in the dark matter halo. So all the stuff that is us is just a tiny perturbation on top of the dark matter system. So the dark matter is the galaxy, and then the rest of the matter is just what we can see. Now, dark matter is often contrasted with what we will say is ordinary matter. That's your protons, neutrons, neutrinos, electrons. All that stuff is ordinary matter, but we often fall into a shorthand and we'll often call that the baryonic matter. Now, baryons are technically only the protons and the neutrons and their associated particle physics friends, uh, not necessarily the electrons or the leptons, or, or the uh, electrons and other leptons, but we kind of lump it all in. And when we say baryonic, we usually just mean ordinary matter. It sounds better that way, I guess. So um, we'll talk more about dark matter halo at the end of the course, because that's important for galaxy evolution. But for now, we're going to sort of put that on snooze and focus on the other visible parts of the galaxy. So the uh, major parts of a galaxy are, uh, the first major part is the stars. And the stars are typically organized into some stellar components. The major parts of a galaxy are the disk, the bulge, and the halo. Uh, the disk is where we live. We we are in the disk of the Milky Way. It is a thin disk of stars. And so the aspect ratio, which is sort of the thickness to the extent, can be very uh, large. Uh, and so it's not like it, it, it's like a dinner plate in dimensionality. It's very large and relatively uh, thin. Uh, here. It is what we call dynamically cold. And when we say dynamically cold, we mean that the ordered motions of the system are small or, or large compared to the random motions. So V ordered is much, much larger than the V random. And the idea here is that in a bunch of ordered motion, all the stars are kind of going on in one direction. In our case, it's the rotation of those stars around the central region of the galaxy. So they're all going in some direction. And then the ordered mo uh, the random motions on this are just tiny little perturbations on top of that. They're going off in these different directions. So we call this dynamically cold because uh, random motions are associated with thermal energy and hot objects have a lot of random motions and a lot of thermal energy. So this is a dynamically cold system is the stellar disk. It's frequently associated with star formation, so it's where new stars are being made, and uh, the colder phases of the interstellar medium. More on that in a few slides. They are often blue in optical colors, so if we look at them, they appear relatively blue, although some systems can have a disk yet still appear as red. The next part of the system is called the bulge. Uh, it's the central region of the galaxy. It's dynamically warmer than the disk, so there's more random motion compared to the orbital motions. Uh, and they are typically old stars that are red in optical colors. So old and red tend to go uh, together in astrophysics, or at least so far as stars go. Uh, more on that next chapter. And the final stellar component is called the halo. The halo is the hardest part of the galaxy to see. It is uh, fairly faint and is broad. It uh, sort of spans around the whole galaxy. Uh, it's a close to spherical distribution of stars that is often dynamically hot, so hot, uh, very random in the motion. Uh, stars have very little indication of rotation or coherent rotation or any kind of coherent orbital motion, and these are often the oldest parts of the galaxy when you look at uh, the stars that are found there. So here's a typical galaxy, and we can see these three stellar parts. Uh, the bulge is down here in the center. This large ring object around here, that's the disk. This is a galaxy that we're looking at close to edge on. So this is like a thin disk, sort of like looking at the aforementioned dinner plate close to edge on, where this is the foreground, the background is difficult to see, 
and then we see the two edges over here. All these other things, a lot of these are stars in our own galaxy. Uh, this is a separate galaxy back there in the background, uh, just like uh, that one. And then all around here is the halo. You can sort of see that there's a diffuse light, and those are stars that are in the halo of the galaxy, and they have uh, orbits that are going around the center of the galaxy, but they're really random in their motion uh, when they're sort of orbiting around the full uh, center, and that gives this big spheroidal distribution of stars. Not much mass out in the halo, uh, but um, almost uh, all of the stars are old and red in color. Here's another galaxy. Uh, this one is a disk system seen edge on, and I like this image because it illustrates just how thin the disk is. It's uh, quite uh, thin compared to its extent. You can see some evidence of a bulge here, a slight thickening in the middle, and then you see the dark feature down the center of the galaxy. That's called the dust lane, and that is presence of interstellar medium in the midplane of the galaxy, blocking out the starlight from behind it. So there's only, a, you know, in a few of these cases, you'll see some stars and stuff in the foreground of the dust lane, but almost all of this stuff, in fact, you can see a lot more over here, you know, for reasons. Um, and they, uh, yeah, and so the um, dust is blocking out light uh, through most of the disk and shows up, and we use this term lane, the dust lane. And this is really one of the archetypical uh, views of a dust lane. Uh, you can also have disk galaxies without any gas and dust. Uh, this is Caldwell 53. Uh, there is a disk here. There is no dust lane to speak of. And then you can see a thin little bulge there. So if we sort of zoom in, you sort of get a sense that there is a bulge. There's a disk of light. And then overall, the whole thing, you see the halo of the star. So those are the three main parts of the galaxy. The next thing I'd like to talk about is stellar substructures. And so these are uh, different parts of the galaxy that are sort of relevant. They're small scale groupings or clusterings of stars. And the first one is clusters versus associations. So we call these star clusters or star associations. And these are groups of stars that kind of appear together on the sky. Uh, both of these uh, types of objects are coeval, uh, and so that means that they are evolving together. Uh, and really it just means they have a common origin together. They were all born in the same star-forming event. The difference between a cluster and an association is really that the clusters are best defined through self-gravity. So a cluster is an object that's self-gravitation, gravitating, Otherwise, we often call it an association. Now, this definition isn't 100% in the field, and we'll kind of get sloppy and just refer to something that is a cluster of stars without knowing that it is already self-gravitating. So we don't worry uh, too much about the precision unless we're focusing in on, like, is this a cluster versus an association? So sometimes the language gets a little bit of loo uh, a little loose. I, though they do th we do want to invoke always that these are stellar groups or populations that are evolving together. And so they'll have common ages uh, and common sets of properties that will allow us to determine how these associations are linked and tell us a bit about their history. A very common form of cluster in our galaxy, uh, well, not common, but commonly studied, is the globular cluster. So these are very old, self-gravitating clusters, uh, and they're typically found associated with the halo of the galaxy, and they tend to be the oldest stars found in a galaxy. We'll often contrast that with open clusters, and I definitely emphasize the air quotes here because a lot of the things that we call open clusters are not known to be self-gravitating. Some are, and they form kind of a continuum of ages and masses with lobular clusters on one end and then young, low-mass, self-gravitating clusters on the other end. Um, but since uh, these op uh, the open clusters, uh, quotes or not, uh, they're often younger, significantly younger than globular clusters, and have been associated with star formation in the disk of the galaxy. 
Here's some pictures of clusters. This is a globular cluster called M15, and you can see it's this nice spherical distribution of stars. And when we see spheres or spheroids, we often think that this is a system that's in gravitational uh, steady state. It has sort of shared all of its energy uh, in different directions. All the motions have become completely randomized for these stars. And so all these stars are orbiting around inside this uh, cluster's gravitational potential well. Uh, and we can add up the mass and we would determine that it has a negative total energy when we add up the orbits of all the individual stars and also the uh, gravitational uh, for the kinetic energy and then the total distribution of mass for the gravitational binding energy. In contrast, you see something like this. This is a stellar association, uh, and so it's often not very well-defined or spherical. You see a bunch of kind of blue uh, stars here grouped together. You see a little bit of the interstellar medium uh, there on the side. And so this stellar uh, association is not going to stay together over the course of uh, several galactic orbits. These stars are going to go their separate ways. Uh, even though they were born together, they'll split up and sort of move throughout the galactic disk uh, together. The other uh, type of substructure we see in galaxies are called are the dynamical features. Uh, we'll focus in this class mostly on spiral arms and bars. These are dynamical patterns that emerge from star orbits in a galaxy. And uh, I like the analogy to that of a wave uh, in these uh, systems. Because like in a water wave, say, an individual water molecule is not moving along with the wave. It has this nice circular pattern of motion where it's participating in a wave, and then it falls away and then goes and participates in the next crest of the wave moving by. And then the dynamical pattern or the wave pattern moves across independent of the mass of the object or of the mass of the system, how that's moving. Similarly, in uh, galaxies, what we're seeing is a convergence of stellar orbits that brings stars together. And when you see that convergence, you see a bit of light associated with it, an enhancement in light, and that shows up in tracing out this wave pattern. And so spiral arms and bars are both of these things. They're collective ensembles of stellar orbits that kind of bring objects together and appear like a coherent feature, even though they're not objects, they are not cell self-gravitating systems that are holding themselves together over a long time, they're just more phenomena than they are objects. And here's an example of a barred spiral galaxy. So this has both of, uh, both features. These long wispy features are the spiral arms. These are sort of collected uh, or stellar orbits. And the reason why they stand out so prominently here is that uh, often in this convergence, you end up squeezing gas clouds down to trigger star formation within them. So you see a big burst of relatively young, high-mass stars that pick, give off a huge amount of light. Uh, in contrast, we also have a stellar bar here with kind of this S-shaped uh, uh, dust lane in it. Uh, so this stellar bar right here is also a dynamical feature. Uh, it is decoupled from the spiral or relate. it is it is not necessarily the same phenomenon as the spiral arms. They aren't connected to each other uh, um, sort of physically, but they are both linked to the dynamical environment over the galaxy. And you'll often see spiral arms starting at the bar ends and uh, proceeding from there because of the way that resonances work in uh, galactic orbits. So you can see both of these features here. Um, our own galaxy is a barred spiral galaxy. We see that right here. There's our bar. Uh, remember, this is an artist's rendition. We had no idea that we were in a barred uh, galaxy until about the 1980s when we got some satellite observations of uh, the galaxy uh, galactic plane from above the Earth's atmosphere in the infrared. But you see these spiral arms uh, picking off it. We're kind of located in an interarm region right now. There's a little spur of the arm uh, kind of going by us. And uh, we have this uh, bright bar feature. So we are a barred spiral galaxy, a little bit more tightly wound uh, than 1365 here. Uh, but, you know, it's a fairly common galactic pattern.
So the next component of a galaxy is the interstellar medium, or the ISM. Uh, this is basically everything else. It's the uh, rest of uh, uh, the system, and it's mostly gas. So when I talk about the ISM, it is almost always uh, the gas between the stars. And we'll often describe this in terms of its temperature. There's a huge range of temperatures from uh, 7 or 8 Kelvin, uh, so degrees above absolute zero, all the way up to tens of millions of Kelvin. Uh, and there's a wide range in there. And we'll often define this uh, by the temperature, cold, cool, warm, hot, with some sort of loose boundaries between them, and then the chemical state of hydrogen. So is it molecular, neutral, or ionized? So the warm neutral medium, the cold neutral medium, the cold molecular medium, etc. These are all different phases of the interstellar medium. Uh, mixed in with the ISM, you will usually find dust. Dust grains are what give us those dust lanes. They're essentially soot. They're, it's a bunch of fine particulate matter. They're not molecules, but they are sort of held together uh, by um, non-ionic or covalent bonding forces. Some of the smallest dust grains sort of cross the line into very large molecules, but these are, I kind of think it is like tiny space gravel or soot or something like that. So those are these small, typically micron-sized grains that fill the uh, space in the galaxy and block out light in the optical. We also have in this uh, interstellar medium the cosmic rays. These are the high energy particles that have been, uh, we think, accelerated by uh, shock waves moving through the interstellar medium, hitting particles and accelerating them close to uh, relativistic speeds. Uh, this also formally includes the interstellar radiation field. So when the starlight flows out from stars and other objects that are emitting light in the galaxy, it makes the interstellar radiation field, and that regulates the thermodynamics of this gas. And finally, the galactic magnetic field is all lumped in here with the ISM. Uh, so uh, yeah, the B field is part of the ISM, even though it's not matter or anything. It's just, you know, the magnetic field. Typically, uh, the magnetic field is very challenging to study, and we think it's important. We just don't know how important uh, and how it's organized geometrically, though we're working very hard to pick that information out. The final part of a galaxy is the supermassive black hole at the center. And any galaxy that has a bulge seems to have a supermassive black hole in, in the middle. And when we say supermassive black hole, that contrasts with stellar mass, which usually run up to about 100 solar masses. And then from 10 to the 4, maybe 10 to the 5, up to 10 to the 9 solar masses, these are the supermassive black holes. They are linked to the bulge in the galaxy. Uh, and we don't exactly know why, we have some models, but it does seem that the mass of the black hole is correlated with the mass of the bulge. And this is wild because these are separated in mass scales by a factor of a thousand. The bulge is much more massive than the supermassive black hole. And it's also uh, in length scales by you know tens of thousands of short sealed radii uh, or up to, sorry, uh, hundreds of millions of short sealed radii uh, out to uh, the outer scale of the bulge. So physically, it's very hard to envision a way that the black hole connects to and evolves with the bulge of the galaxy. They should have nothing to do with each other because of the vast difference of scales, but something is coupling them together. Um, so given the tiny amount of mass in uh, the black hole relative to the bulge, it's unimportant dynamically. So in our solar system, all the planets go around the sun because the sun is 99% of the mass of the system. In uh, a galaxy, the supermassive black hole is at the center, but it is not the massive object that everything is going around. Instead, everything is going around because of kind of a collective gravitational agreement all the mass and all the uh, all the mass is attracted to all of the other mass and it's forming this single coherent object that is uh, moving around in organized or random motions uh, but it is not the supermassive black hole that is regulating the kind of gravitational action of the um, system 
The other thing that supermassive black holes are important for, and probably the link to why the bulge is uh, connected to the supermassive black hole, is they're very important for generating galaxy jets uh, and uh, through this process that we call feedback. So feedback is an important thing for regulating galaxy evolution long term. This image shows a supermassive black hole. Uh, you've probably seen this picture. This is the uh, black hole at the center of M87. You're actually only seeing the shadow of the black hole. This is the uh, about the size of the Schwarzer rays. This is some millimeter wave emission uh, from around the central region of the black hole. Uh, around the black hole, and this is casting a shadow here. And so the general relativistic effects are kind of shaping the light around it, allowing us to infer properties about the black hole. But this is about a billion solar mass black hole here at the center of the galaxy, still much smaller than the galaxy as a whole. Indeed, we can look at the galaxy as a whole, kind of zoom back a little bit, and the supermassive black hole is a little region inside there. And the important thing that we see is uh, this little jet coming out the center. And so this is the feature of uh, supermassive black hole feedback that we're quite interested in, uh, because this seems to be the way that these relatively tiny objects in a galaxy can regulate the evolution of a galaxy as a whole. We can zoom in on the jet in a bit more detail. Uh, so this was the supermassive black hole image that we looked at. Here's the optical image we just took a peep at. And uh, you can sort of see this is a zoom in uh, to progressively smaller scales uh, showing where the black hole is. And there is this long feature. It kind of has this stripy look because this is an image associated with the magnetic field studies uh, in the system. So this is showing the polar polarization direction of the light uh, that we're seeing here in the radio. And the fact that it's kind of tangled tells you a bit about uh, the nature of the jet physics. Okay, so at this point, we're going to go on a uh, quick tour of the spectral energy distribution of galaxies. Uh, these are all images of the same galaxy. Uh, this is NGC 1566, 1566. And what we're looking at is an image of the galaxy in optical light. And so what I want to do over the next few slides is to show you what this looks like in different colors of light across the spectral energy distribution to emphasize how we see the different parts of galaxies, and to show that we can use these different patterns and structure of light in these different bands to figure out a lot about galactic astrophysics. So what we're seeing uh, is a uh, picture here, and this is an inverted image. So black is a lot of light, and uh, white is not much. I can uh, change that. Uh, I'm using like a little uh, click, uh, point click, Google Maps like interface that allows us to sort of zoom in and move around on the um, actual images. And you look in and see small star clusters and dust lanes and other features here. As we go through, we see the nuclear region. Uh, this is a barred galaxy, so we see the bar across here. Two simply phenomenal spiral arms coming off of this. And then this gray square here is just the edge of the image. This is a Hubble Space Telescope image. Uh, there's a little bit of noise and chatter around the uh, edge of the image. Uh, but otherwise, it's this beautiful uh, image that we can analyze in, uh, this is the F438 image uh, from Hubble. And so the that means it's 438 nanometers. So this is blue light uh, optically here. So if I'm going to go back to the black and white image, we can flip back and forth here. Uh, it's neat because you do see all these little uh, dust lines here and it sort of highlights uh, the features well. So black now is representing a lot of light. And we can toggle up and down through the uh, spectral energy distribution. So let's go now to slightly longer wavelength light. This is an F555 image, so 555 nanometers, so yellowish light. Uh, and there, if I can sort of flip back and forth, what you can see, uh, these have slightly different stretches here, uh, but you see very similar uh, structure 
uh, between the two uh, um, the two images. Uh, though it kind of looks like the bulge is a little bigger and then you can also see some light out here beyond the spiral arms a little better. I'm going to go into the F814 image. Uh, so that's the uh, near infrared at this point, and those arms are getting a little bit more prominent here uh, and here, uh, and then the dust lanes are getting a little fainter. And this tells us a bit about dust. It's actually really kind of cool because dust scatters a light and blocks light more effectively at short wavelengths. So the blue light that we saw lots and lots of dust features. Uh, so these are all kind of, uh, you know, popping out here. But if I go to the 814, they're becoming less prominent. You just don't see them down here uh, the way you do uh, in this image. They really stand out and block the light effectively in the short wavelength light. Uh, we can kind of continue out along the SED. Uh, this is changing from a Hubble Space Telescope image. This is now new data from the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, and so this is an image uh, here, and you can really see the spiral arms uh, kind of flowing out. Uh, you get a good hint of the uh, bar right here. The bulge of the galaxy is here. There's a little white spot right in the center. That's a point where there was too much light and it, over it uh, saturated the detector. Uh, caused some uh, issues with the data reduction. Uh, you can actually, uh, I'm sitting here with my uh, other, uh, my work eyeballs on, and you can sort of see these square edges here. That's a problem for my night job when I have to work on calibrating uh, these images here and try to figure out uh, what's going on and try to produce really, you know, nice images uh, from here without these instrumental effects uh, built into it. Uh, you can actually see all these lovely uh, background galaxies here. Uh, so that little feature there is a galaxy behind it. Uh, here's another background and another background galaxy up there. Uh, but overall, we're seeing very nice uh, kind of structure of the galaxy as a whole uh, without any of the dust features. There's no extinction showing up here. So we can sort of zoom in. You don't see the extinction features. But if I go into the optical, there's the dust blocking all of the background light. So, uh, you know, a, you know, essentially dust-free view of the galaxy, at least in these outer parts of the system. All right, let's uh, take a look at shorter wavelengths. So we go from the 438 nanometer light. Uh, we can take a step into the ultraviolet. That This is the 336 nanometer light, so now we are firmly into the near ultraviolet, and we see that the dust really starts to stand out and the uh, um, uh, blocking the light here. Uh, you see that there's uh, very patchy features here, and these are the bluest stars, the ultraviolet stars in the system. So it's actually, it looks quite clumpy. You see less of the ordinary stars. And you can sort of see that, the sort of gray region in between the arms, that's filled with stars. But if we look in the uh, near ultraviolet, that sort of fades away and you really just see these clumps associated with the spiral arms. And that's because this is where star formation is occurring and it's making hot young stars uh, right here. And we can take another step further into the near ultraviolet. This is now the 275 nanometer view. Again, quite clumpy. The inner arm regions uh, here have essentially faded away. There's very few stars giving light off in these regions. So you can't even see the dust lanes because there's not light for the dust lanes to block. They're quite significant in regions. You can see the hints of them there. There's this lane across the center of the galaxy right here. Uh, so you can see that dust lane there popping out, uh, but there's just not much light. So the inner arm, re inter arm regions tend to be kind of dark in the ultraviolet, and so the dust is kind of blocking that out. Now, let's return uh, to the longer wavelength side of the data. So this was the 200 uh, F200, which is a two micrometer. Uh, data. And if we take a step, one step further to like the mid infrared and the 7.7 .7 micron, things change dramatically. So this is an image, all this sort of white specks, again, 
it's a problem for my night job. Uh, the image reduction wasn't uh, quite uh, what it needs to be. I should get this fixed up. But this 7.7 .7 micron is a completely different view of the galaxy compared to what we were looking at here at uh, two microns. What's happening here is we're seeing the dust. So all of that light that was over here and getting blocked uh, here, that blocked light was getting absorbed uh, by dust grains. And those dust grains are re-radiating that radiation in the mid-infrared. So you can see that same structure. So what is dark uh, here, these sort of lanes of dust here, uh, maybe focus here on this region. Uh, if we look in the infrared, it pops right out really bright feature showing you where the dust emission is. So we see the dust extinction here, and then we see the dust emission uh, here. So block the light out, re-radiate it in the infrared. And we can go even a step further out to 21 micron data. Uh, and this 21 micron data, you'll notice the resolution's getting worse. The wavelength is really long. Uh, so that means that the um, resolution of the telescope is intrinsically worse at these long wavelengths. So it looks a little blurry. And you see all these little spots, blah, 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 all these little uh, individual sources. And these are uh, the star forming regions that are heating up the dust around them. And they're kind of breaking free. So you can also see them. Uh, these are the young stars and the, they're all hot young stars. And then this is the region where the radiation is heating the dust around them. And so it's really quite bright in those uh, uh, stars. Okay, so that sort of shows us the stars in the galaxy and the dust in the galaxy. And we can also see some other features in the interstellar medium. Uh, this particular image looks a lot like the 21 micron image. Uh, except it doesn't have that wispy interior uh, structure. You just see the tiny little sources. This is the Balmer Alpha line. So this is hydrogen uh, spectral line uh, at 656 nanometers. And what we're observing is uh, the uh, radiation when high mass stars ionize gas, so hydrogen splits into a proton and electron, and then when it reconnects, uh, and, call, uh, uh, and when it reconnects and forms a neutral atom again, uh, the electron falls down through the, the energy levels and radiates a line here. So you'll see that this, these regions are also associated with those high mass star forming regions uh, throughout the galaxy. So we kind of see all of that. And then the other kind of stuff that we can see in the SED is other features of the interstellar medium. So there we see uh, this, this image shows the carbon monoxide emission. And so carbon monoxide is a molecule and it traces the coldest phase of the interstellar medium. Uh, so this is cold molecular gas, which is the raw material for star formation. So what we're seeing here, these little uh, arms here, are the gas that is getting ready to, or is in the middle of forming stars. So you see that those arms are, all this star formation that we're seeing here is located where the gas is. So this is the raw material, and then this region here, or even the short wavelength light, is tracing where the stars are forming in this system. So. This has really been, uh, I hope, an interesting tour and give you a sense that all this different information in the light of a galaxy really just embeds this uh, additional uh, information that we get a lot of physics context out of. And we can just sort of step through all these different images and see the different light in the galaxy, uh, picking out different physics, telling stories about regions, and really understanding the um, what's actually important for how galaxies evolve. Okay, the next thing to talk about is the ideas of the characteristic scales of galaxies. We focused on parts of a single galaxy, and then we're, part, uh, we're now sort of turning our attention to saying, well, what different types of galaxies are there? And there's a huge range in galactic properties, uh, a broader range in galactic properties than there is in even stars. Um, 
And I'll just give some sort of characteristic values. Uh, these are just boundaries. There's not a firm physics limit on either end of these. This just sort of shows the typical range of the objects that we'll study in this class. And I've given uh, what we're sort of talking about. We'll talk about uh, its units, and then there's this kind of characteristic range. And then for context, I've put the Milky Way uh, our galaxy into this chart. And you can see, uh, for example, in terms of mass, the amount of baryonic mass, which, you know, is just ordinary matter mass, uh, that ranges from about 10 to the 7 to 10 to the 11. And we're up here at the top end um, of that mass range. Uh, the dark matter is significantly larger. So there's 100 to 1,000 times more dark matter in the galaxy. Uh, we're up here at about 10 to the 12 solar masses in our dark matter halo, so a trillion solar masses. Uh, and you'll notice that's a uh, factor of um, 20 larger than our uh, actual baryonic matter. And then uh, we have the uh, luminosity of the galaxy. Uh, that ranges from 10 to the 6 to 5 times 10 to the 10 solar luminosities. Again, we're kind of up at the top end of this. And then we have the sizes of galaxies. These are kiloparsec-sized objects. So we have a characteristic scale length or size of our disk of about 10 kiloparsecs. It, of course, extends off and just kind of fades away beyond that. Uh, but this, you know, on a similar scale, that ranges between like half and 30 uh, kiloparsecs. And then galaxies' ages are typically between a billion years old up to close to the age of the universe, uh, 14 billion years. Uh, and though uh, this number is being revised upward rapidly with the new JWST uh, data. So let's go over just some of the different types of galaxies that we see across the, ma uh, across the mass range. Uh, so this we looked at before, M87. We call this an elliptical galaxy. There's no noticeable disk in the system, uh, completely dominated by random motions. Uh, altogether, there's not really a bulge. In fact, the whole galaxy is kind of a bulge uh, and is connected to the black hole, uh, probably through the action of this jet. But Ellipticals are just one type of galaxy. Uh, we also see uh, spiral galaxies or disk galaxies more generally. Uh, this is a famous interacting pair of galaxies called uh, the Whirlpool Galaxy. Uh, it's a beautiful grand design spiral uh, galaxy. Uh, that's the spiral. And this little thing out here is a gal uh, another galaxy. It's an elliptical and it's kind of going by and the tidal forces from this gravity are driving strong spiral features here in uh, the Whirlpool. So it's just why it looks so fantastically beautiful. Uh, but you have a small bulge down here, this galaxy. This is a top-down view of the system. It's fairly close to edge, uh, face on. Uh, so we get a good top-down view uh, with a bulge. No discernible bar in this particular image. So it's not as strongly barred as some of the other systems we're looking at. You can get a system like a dwarf spiral galaxy or a small disk galaxy. Uh, dwarfs tend to be dominated by gas, uh, so most of their mass is in the interstellar medium, and so they tend to look young uh, with a lot of blue light in their stars. Uh, not much in the way of a bulge here in this system. It looks like just a disk of stars. We're looking at it kind of obliquely from the side. You see substantial evidence in the galaxy population of collisions. This is one collision happening. There's two galaxies happening uh, to move by each other and collide with each other. And it's driving what's called a starburst in the system. So it's this rapid burst of star formation uh, from the... It's a rapid burst of star formation from these two galaxies crashing together. Uh, we see systems that are often called lenticular galaxies. This is a disk galaxy that's viewed edge on. We see a significant dust system uh, with a little bit of a bulge and an extended disk. Uh, lenticulars don't necessarily always have a, a dust lane. Uh, the a, the um, Caldwell 53 that we looked at earlier uh, would be called a lenticular. These are often also called uh, S0 systems for reasons that we will talk about in just a moment. And then we also have irregular galaxies, which are 
just kind of no identifiable geometry uh, on top of them. Uh, things are sort of disorganized. And these are galaxies that are still kind of in the action of formation where their collective gravity hasn't acted over enough times uh, to actually cause it to uh, sort of settle into a discernible pattern. So we think these are galaxies that are probably coming together and are being heavily shaped by the individual events of star formation and gas mass buildup. Uh, within them. So all of these systems uh, kind of give you some of the names and the types of objects that we see, but will often fall into uh, a trap, uh, which is to call them by what we call their Hubble type. And that Hubble type is built off of this tuning fork uh, diagram that appears in the astronomer Hubble's uh, uh, one of books. And so you can sort of see uh, this diagram here showing elliptical galaxies on one side and then normal and barred spirals on the other. And the difference between normal and barred is what gives it this tuning fork structure. Um, this was thought to be, but is not actually an evolutionary sequence. So things do not change. Uh, originally Hubble proposed that they evolved in this direction, but the reason why I show you this kind of outdated structure is we often still use the designations to describe galaxies. Uh, ellipticals are defined as E followed by a single digit number, an E0 to an E9, uh, and so if you see uh, this is an E4 galaxy, that's a uh, elliptical system with a, a sort of, as the numbers get larger, they get more elliptical or spread out. So their major to minor axis ratio uh, changes. The spirals are given a designator S and they're given a letter. A, B, C, there's an S, D as well uh, out on, uh, out past this, and that's the tightness of the arm winding. So an SA versus an SC, an SA has tighter arms, it's sort of wound up tighter. SBs, uh, S capital B means it's a barred spiral, so an SBB system is a barred spiral with moderately wound uh, spiral arms. And so this is about what we think the Milky Way is, uh, maybe between uh, these two. Uh, systems. And then in between them are the aforementioned S0. So these are things that have a bit of a disk, uh, but also uh, sort of look like the old red populations of the elliptical galaxies. Uh, so S0s are kind of in between. So it's not an evolutionary sequence. We often fall into this designation. And the worst part about it is we use the words as if it were an evolutionary sequence. So we'll often call the elliptical ga uh, uh, galaxies early and the spiral galaxies late. And so I bring this up because if we read papers with, oh, it's an early type system uh, or a late type system, not actually an evolutionary sequence. It's just telling you that it's an elliptical versus a spiral galaxy. And there's a lot of corollary features that come with that. We'll uh, study them more, but to understand them, we really need the full armament of stellar populations. Now, I'm going to close out by talking a little bit about our own galaxy and some unique features that we have to deal with because we're in our own galaxy. I've shown you these beautiful top-down views of the system, uh, but this is really what we see when we look up at night, and you see that we are stuck in the middle of a galaxy disk. We'll run something like that. There's a bulge towards the center, and there is, you bet, a dust lane all over the system. You can sort of see uh, local uh, dust features uh, off the uh, galactic plane, and then a strong feature in the plane of the galaxy. These are satellite galaxies uh, down here. Um, these are the Magellanic Clouds. And uh, these are, so this is what we see when we look up at night. This is actually what we see if we look up at night at two microns. So you remember 1566, we stopped seeing th uh, light blocked by dust. Similarly, when we look at two microns, we see this feature here. Uh, and so we really see that we are in a thin disk of a galaxy. And there's a bit of a peanut shape 
to uh, the central bulge of the galaxy, which is the, one of the main lines of evidence that we have a bar in the center of our galaxy, where we sort of have a near side of the bar and a far side of the bar uh, pointing uh, towards and away from, uh, sorry, uh, sort of towards us and away from us. So this shows you uh, sort of evidence for, uh, you know, a, us living in a barred spiral galaxy. There's still a little extinction here. This sort of red feature in the mid plane is that you were looking through so much dust that it nonetheless gets blocked. Uh, it blocks a little bit of the light there. Since we're in our galaxy, we'll often have to refer to this galactocentric polar coordinate system. So we're out here uh, in a sort of cylindrical polar system, and we think about that where the midplane of the galaxy is uh, sort of this section of a cylinder, and uh, we're located some distance out here from the center, 8.172 kiloparsecs from the center of the galaxy. But we'll often care about how far a given object is from the center, because galaxies have radial structure. They have you know, more mass in the center, and then it falls off as it goes out uh, to larger radii. And uh, so we set up this coordinate system to kind of deal with the fact that we aren't stuck at the center. Uh, so we have a radial axis coordinate. That's the what's often called R sub gal or galactocentric radius. We see an angle, a polar angle theta, which is how far it is around from a reference line. Uh, so our, you know, the sun is here. And so that's kind of chosen as the reference line, though theta is less important of a coordinate. And then the vertical uh, direction is Z gal. So that's how far an object, say that object, is above the galactic midplane. And if we want to figure out where an object is in the system, we just rely on uh, some trigonometry. So a typical problem is that we observe an object in galactic longitude, latitude, and measure the distance to the object, often pretty hard. And we'd like to know where it is in galactocentric radius and vertical displacement from the uh, center in this cylindrical polar system. And sometimes we'd also like to know what the angle is. And so we set up a triangle here where the galactic center forms one point of the triangle, the sun forms another point, and then the target is the third point. And if we know the distance, uh, and this is just looking top down in the system, uh, we can actually set up a law of cosines triangle where we figure out this angle, which is the uh, opposite of the galactic latitude angle. That's uh, this angle here. And so we can figure out that as the r squared d squared minus 2r d cos theta, where r naught is the distance from the sun to the galactic center, which is a measured fixed value. If we really want to, we can figure out the angle using the law of sines, uh, using this relationship once we've figured out what r gal is. And then if we're looking uh, at the vertical displacement, we just need to know the distance, and then that projects d sine theta to figure out how far the object is above the galactic plane. So this distance here is just d sine theta. Sorry, B, I said B, uh, beta, I meant B uh, for the galactic latitude. So that gives us the toolkit we need to kind of navigate around in our own galaxy. And as we sort of study st uh, stellar populations, uh, we'll be using this math to sort of figure out where things are in the galaxy. All right, that concludes what I wanted to talk about on this subject. And uh, thank you all very much for watching.